Welcome to Open Democracy's weekly live discussion. My name is Caroline Malloy and I am the editor of Open Democracy's UK section and also our, our NHS section. Uh, we, this, this week we're going to be talking about what's happening to your GP data and what you can do about it. And we do want this conversation to involve as many of you viewing at home as possible. Uh, so particular thanks to the many people who submitted questions and comments ahead of time. I'll try and address as many of them as possible. If you haven't submitted a question in advance, but you want to whilst you are viewing, please do participate. You can put your question in the chat window if you're viewing on Zoom by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you're watching on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments there and they will be fed through to me as well. So GP data, well, we know that health data is both hugely sensitive and immensely valuable, both to our health and to big business. Indeed, the UK's NHS data has been valued by Ernst & Young at £10 billion per year, and our GP data is the most detailed, valuable and sensitive of all. So on the 12th of May this year, the then Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, quietly issued a legal direction to every GP in England instructing them to upload their patient records, our records, to a central database and patients were given just a few weeks to find out about the plan. So along with a coalition of other groups, including Dermot who's joining me on this call, Open Democracy issued a legal threat that has forced the government to pause the process for now. But what does all this mean for your health data? What will happen next and what can you do about it? So as I say, I'm joined today by an uh, expert panel. I'm delighted to introduce you to Dermot McDonald, who is the lead organiser of Just Treatment, a patient-led campaign fighting to ensure patients and the NHS are always put before profit. And by Dr Helen Salisbury, who is a GP in Oxford, who also teaches medical students and junior doctors and writes for the British Medical Journal on this and other topics. And by Phil Booth, who is a campaigner and uh, coordinator for Med Confidential, an organisation which campaigns for confidentiality and consent in health and social care. So I think I'm going to kick off uh, because obviously people joining this call may be aware that something's been going on in regards to health data and um, we have had some success in slowing down what was planned. But I think Dermot, because you, you have been joining us and Foxglove and the other organisations who raised legal concerns about what was going on and we had a lot of questions from the audience uh, from participants like is this even legal how can they do this so can you just maybe start off by telling us a little bit about where we are now the the, the data upload was actually due to happen today wasn't it initially and that's not now happening correct yeah exactly. um, can you hear me okay i'm getting a little bit of echo is the sound all right for you it is once you start talking, do carry on. Then. Okay, awesome. So, uh, yeah, well, I guess, like, I suppose the vast majority of the 55 million people that this affects, I didn't know about this until, like, many of the weeks after the process had started and time was already ticking to give people a chance to do something about it for their own personal data. And so what we know is that the government is planning to and was expecting to do on the 1st of July, transfer cradle to grave data that is held about us, all codified about very intimate aspects of our life, all kinds of um, information about our health records that are held by our GPs into a centralized database um, that would then be fed uh, kind of uh, in, in real time from the thence force uh, to create this really huge, unprecedented, detailed set of data about the health of the nation and, and the health of each of us as individuals. Um, and the reason we uh, took the initial action with, with Foxglove and then with the rest of this amazing coalition of people was, uh, I would say, on two grounds, broadly speaking. First of all, like, most people, I think, do not have a clue this is happening. And, and certainly most of the publicity that has occurred around this has been as a result of the fact that we've taken this legal challenge to what the government's doing. And when decisions like this are taken about our health data, there are legal requirements on the government to ensure that there is proper opportunity for there to be proper informed consent and 
a proper consultation undertaken to ensure that everybody knows what's going on and they've got a chance to have their say. Uh, that's not what we're seeing in the way that the government has gone about this. Really, I think we could have hardly imagined a, you know, a way that they could have done this better if they were hoping to have sneak this out with nobody noticing. It really looks like it was designed for it to be uh, uh, slipped under the radar. Um, thankfully, um, many of the people on this call were alert to what the government were doing um, and mobilized to try and delay it. And so first and foremost, we've got this, uh, we've got this delay in the implementation. So now we've got until the 1st of September before this huge transfer of data occurs. Um, and in that time, we hope the government will proactively engage the country in a debate, give people the opportunity to have their say about what happens with their data and understand the implications of that. Um, but then also, so, so that's the first part of it. The second part really is, um, do we have enough information and do we have enough understanding? And has there been a proper public debate about some of the details of what's going to happen? So even if we've got more time, will we truly understand the, the details of how our data is being used, going to be used, who's going to use it, uh, and what consequence it will have for the future of our healthcare system. Uh, and we would argue that there probably is likely to be, um, or there's unlikely to be sufficient information for us to um, forthcoming from the government in that this extended time period. Um, and even if we got it, third point, do we want it to happen and do we want it to happen in the way that it's being done and 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 hopefully and uh, that's that's what we'll get into a little bit more detail tonight but basically in summary we think the government was acting unlawfully to push this through at the speed it was doing and we've got a window of a of another month and a half basically to try and create um the the space for people to have an informed uh, discussion on this and and maybe pressure uh, the government to changing some of the more fundamental aspects of, of what's being proposed. Thank you, Derma. And I think you say that we, you, know, what you rightly say about the need for a greater public debate. And I think I would say that to the extent that there has been a public debate at, uh, of late, uh, credit should probably go considerably to Phil Booth, who I've worked with over a number of years, mm -hmm. who's been talking about uh, this issue and mm -hmm. previous attempts to get uh, government's hands on our data uh, after private medical data. So I think obviously a lot of people on this call will have quite a high level of knowledge, but just to not assume too much basic level of knowledge to begin with, Phil, could you just maybe set out for us what is the data exactly that they're going to get our hands on it and, and what is what is the basic nature of the concern? Because they're saying, aren't they, that this is just necessary to, to save lives, to do medical research, etc, etc. So what, what in a nutshell is really going on here that's causing so much concern, Phil? Um, well, people on the call possibly may not um, remember 2014 when they tried this before with a program called Care.Data. Um, it is the GP data that they're going for. So we're talking about the, the, the data for every person, man, woman and child, who is currently registered with a GP practice in England. That's who it affects. Yeah? It's not Scotland, it's not Wales, it's not Northern Ireland, it's just England. Okay. Thereafter, Dermot mentioned coded or codified data. The way in which uh, information about your health is recorded in the NHS so that it can be passed around and used by computer systems is using what are called codes. Yeah? That doesn't mean it's hidden. Yeah? Each of the codes has a meaning and that meaning is published in a dictionary so you can just look up you know, what every single code means. Yeah? So you your GP record contains a bunch of these codes, a lifelong, if you like, trail of these codes. Uh, each of them may refer to a, a diagnosis, an observation, a treatment, some medication you've been given, a test result, what have you. So, you know, when the government and NHS Digital tried sort of proposing this and saying, well, it's not, we're not taking your whole medical record because we're not taking the sort of scanned letters that are sort of attached to your record or or you might not take uh you know some tiny amounts of information that are uh legally they're legally forbidden from being taken like things about uh gender reassignment and certain bits of information about ivf they are going to be taking as dermot said your entire gp history yeah and each of those items of information each of those coded items of information will be 
links to your NHS number, your date of birth, and your full postcode. Those items of information yeah, will be uh, obscured, temporarily obscured, if you like, by a process called pseudonymization. Don't know if you need to go into the technicals, but essentially they're using a pseudonym to replace your NHS number and you know, similar for your date of birth and for your full postcode. But those pseudonyms are applied by software that NHS Digital itself has you know, told the GP IT suppliers to use. And when it receives the data, it openly admits that it can reverse that and see your NHS number and your date of birth and your full postcode. And they need to do that because they need to link together the pieces of information. Okay? Without those pseudonyms or without those pieces of information, you couldn't continue to add you know, the next things that are happening to you when you go to see your GP to your line of data. And similarly, when they're trying to link it across from your GP data to your hospital data, which they already collect, they need this, you know, these pseudonyms or these identifiers to link across. That means that what they are dealing with is personal data without dispute. Yeah? They have tried to say or use words like anonymized and what have you, but this is personal data. And that is why this is unlawful because, yeah, because it's personal data, we all have rights under data protection law, what's called the UK GDPR. And what they were proposing to do, while they thought they had a legal basis, you know, Matt Hancock directed NHS Digital to send a data provision notice to the GP practice, and there's bits of law, you know, that says they can do each of those steps. They were ignoring the bigger picture, which is that this is our personal data, and they can't just claim it's anonymous when it isn't. To go to the other end, like Dermot was saying, once they've got it, you know, they haven't got any data yet, so we can only look at what they're already doing with the data that they have. And what we've been doing at Med Confidential for some years now is republishing what are called the data release registers. That's the customers of NHS Digital. And you can all go and see this on a site that we put up called theysolditanyway.com. And you can see there that while there are entirely legitimate uses of this data, which I think most of us, if not all of us, want, which are you know, ethical research and, and, and planning to, to help run services and improve them, there are many commercial users and reusers of this data in that you know, published register. And what we have is a series also of, um, at the top of that page that we've done, we have pulled out those you know, organizations which have broken the terms of their agreement with NHS Digital, and in some cases, which have themselves broken the law with the data that they have received, and yet they are still receiving data. So that's hopefully gives you a sense of the flow. You know, this is very detailed stuff from your entire life, yours, your kids, you know, if you're registered with a GP practice in England, it's that very detailed data linkable to all the other data that they are, they are getting from elsewhere around the NHS, and it's up for sale. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. That was a really comprehensive, good introduction, I think. And one of the, the questions that I've just seen in the chat is about GPs' responsibility in all of this. And of course, GPs are playing a, a key role in this. I've had contacts from friends of mine who are GPs who aren't particularly political saying, what's going on? How can I stop this? I don't quite, I, I don't quite follow. So Helen, as, as a GP yourself in Oxford, who is following this, I know, can you tell us, I mean, what do GPs know about all of this? Because obviously- Key responsibility. I mean, we really, I mean, I found out through social media and through contacts, I didn't find out that this was happening through anything to do with my work. Um, wow. And so far, we, our advice that we've received from our local medical committee, which is a kind of overseeing body for the three counties where I live, is that yes, legally, we do have to comply and hand over the data. Now, obviously there's gonna be a challenge to that, but that is what doctors are being told at the moment, is that we, we don't have a choice. Um, and the legal situation is that we have to hand over patient's data. Now, I think there are a lot of 
GPs who, if, if they've stopped to think about it at all, think that that is entirely unethical against the spirit of um, data protection regulations and we really shouldn't be doing it. And also incredibly harmful to our relationships with our patients. If somebody comes to see me uh, and people talk about all sorts of things in their consultations and lots of them are very, very sensitive. Um, and will they tell me how much they drink or about the discord in their marriage or if they think I'm going to code domestic violence and it'll go as a code to somewhere else or if they can see that they're even things like you know that they've their their weight's rather high or they're drinking too much alcohol actually these are all really personal things and they don't expect in talking to me that that information will end up somewhere else um, and be used for all sorts of other purposes now some patients may be fine with that they may be absolutely fine um, and people have all sorts of different attitudes i'm one of those people who every time i open a website i'm clicking you know, reject all I'm, i don't want you to have anything about me and i don't want you to send me some other people don't really care and that, that's that's absolutely fine but we need a choice and we need proper consent and the way things are going even now with this two-month gap I'm really concerned that some of my patients, particularly my patients who are not online, um, who maybe don't speak English as their first language, who have cognitive difficulties or learning difficulties, all sorts of reasons, or are just incredibly busy, might not get it together to decide to opt out. So I th I'm really worried that we will end up with something that has not been consented to. And that's the really big thing, because there are lots and lots of good arguments about using lots of data, not the arguments we've been given, actually, it's really the, the, the health secretary who just left you was useless. Um, but one of the things he, he kept sort of throwing in totally irrelevant things like dexamethasone and COVID. I mean, that was not discovered through trawling through big data that was discovered by proper scientific randomized controlled trial with consent from all participants um, so there's all sorts of rubbish being being thrown at you to try and persuade people that this is you know we have to do it this way um, there are I'm, I'm sorry i'm rambling a little um, carry but, on if you have something important to say do you want to say it now or no that's you? absolutely fine i'm gonna hand over to phil because he's itching to say something to just one point on the GPs, because we're talking with the BMA, the RCGP, so the British Medical Association, the Royal College of General Practitioners, and the uh, uh, local medical committees, including those uh, across the country, have already said they're not going to comply. For those people who are GPs or, or medically aware in the audience, to go back to what GPs have been told, they have received a lawful data provision notice from NHS Digital. That is lawful. So there is a requirement on them to share the data. But GPs are themselves data controllers. I see questions in the in the chat about who owns my data. The situation in, in law is that the GP is the data controller of their patient's data. And therefore, as a data controller under the GDPR, they have obligations to their patients and obligations as data controllers. And that lawful requirement from NHS Digital does not wipe out their responsibilities and obligations as data controllers. So at the moment, it is an entirely legitimate thing for any and every GP to simply not comply. Yeah? You have to signal your compliance with that data provision notice. It is entirely lawful for them not to signal their compliance on the basis that they do not believe that the scheme is fully compliant with data protection law. And the acid test for that is that NHS Digital has not published what's called its data protection impact assessment. Every practice, every practice in England, you know, as a data controller is required to have at least seen, if not actually done, a satisfactory data protection impact assessment 
And until that has been done, they can simply not comply. They can be told all sorts of things by their own professional bodies, by the government or whatever else, but that is the law. We've taken you know, legal advice on this, legal opinion on this. We are supporting practices and LMCs that are standing behind this position. I think there'll be an open letter going out next week about it. But let's be really clear, at this point, the government cannot take the data you know, from the GPs without the GP having complied and at the moment, that would be against their lawful obligations under the data protection law. So if GPs are, as it sounds, caught between a rock and a hard place, really, with, with two conflicting, essentially, sets of legal obligations. And yep. I, I understand from talking to GPs myself uh, this week that if GPs don't comply with what Matt Hancock wrote to them and told them to do, mm -hmm. they may technically be breaking the law, but there isn't actually, as I understand it, any... No, 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 they will not be breaking, they will not be breaking the law. Okay. Right. They will not yeah. be breaking the law. Let's be really, really clear here. They will not be breaking the law. Yeah. yeah? And you can't, one thing cannot wipe out the other. There is a conflict, but they will not be breaking the law. So you have two conflicting NHS legal England, NHS, Department of Health and Social Care, NHS Act, all these bodies throwing their weight around may say, you must do this, but they can't obviate the, the GP's obligations under data protection law and until they have satisfied that yeah there is a lawful basis which is not the same as saying doing it is lawful yeah and there's a really interesting quest question about who does that data protection impact assessment because yes. one suggestion is that NHS Digital should be doing that for us because actually we don't know what they're going to do with the data so it's really difficult for us to do it but it does also look a bit like marking their own homework and would I trust the assessment that they made? Well, you shouldn't, but they have to publish one. They have to publish a DPIA because, as you say, it's their system. Once so, they publish it, then the BMA, the British Medical, Medical Association, the Royal College of General Practitioners and some of the GPs we're already talking to will do their own. And then the profession should own its DPIA, which may say different things from what NHS Digitals does. But until the two are aligned, you know, this stuff can still be held off by simple lawful... We're not going to do that by September, are we? Pardon? No, no, no. Sorry, 1st of September, I should have said this. But yeah, that is the date that is currently public because that is the date that the government could unilaterally state because they control the upload date. Yeah, And when Joe Churchill stood up just before you know, Jim Bethel was going to get completely torn apart in the Lords, yeah, um, they said the 1st of September. That was just pulled out of the air. We're, you know, we're talking with the operational people. This is going to take six months at least to fix at the back end. We've got things called trusted research environments need, that need fixing. They're going to have to reissue the directions. They're going to have to reissue the data protection notices. They're going to have to do, you know, some sort of mass communication. We're saying right to every patient, yeah, at the very least, as well as a nationwide, as, as Derma is saying, I mean, a nationwide communications campaign, people being aware of this stuff. There's no way they can do that before you know, spring, possibly early summer of next year. But that doesn't mean to say they mightn't try to do it, which is why we need the legal challenges in place. And a lot of this uh, is picking up on some of the questions that I had in advance about, you know, how we can actually improve this process. And I think your comment, Phil, about the fact that they need to write to everybody in the country and tell them, because that is what they did, not very well, I know, but they did it a few years ago when well, they, they were did, trying they did to it do it. It's very, very different. It, it very, was very great, different. But, but they haven't written to, you know, I've certainly had nothing to the post about it. And I think, uh, <laughs> you know, Derma, are the patient representatives that you're talking to, have they heard about anything about it in particular? No, I think that's one of the things that um, was most shocking about this. Like, this is a really significant change with big, big implications. And and the patients that we work with, like 201, they were completely shocked. They had not heard a whisper about this um, and they were really quite angry about it as well. I think, you know, as, uh, as I think Helen said, some people, some patients might be OK with this, um, but it's they're not OK with their opinion on this being taken for granted or an assumption being made about what they think. Um, and I think it's really important. And it may be a, a slightly broader point. Data protection kind of relies upon informed consent. Like we need to have 
and underst- and, and medical practice as well and relies upon that as a kind of a core tenant as to how we do it in an ethical and, and appropriate way and a legal way um, and that informed consent needs to come on an individual level so do i understand what is happening to my data do i understand who's going to get it what they're going to use it for uh, and how it might impact upon my life and my health and my family's well-being like all of those kinds of things at a very individual level are really critical and frankly we don't have enough information to answer those questions right now i think there's a second point which i think is also quite important in this that's much broader because um some people will say, and, and you know, lots of the claims about the impact that AI and data will have on health are probably quite overblown because there's companies like Future Profits are built upon the, the, uh, like the impressiveness of the claims they can make. Um, but uh, some people will argue that this, is, this kind of data and this kind of technology is going to fundamentally change how healthcare works. It's going to have a transport, transformative effect and if we guess, if we look across to something like how the internet changed how shopping functioned, it's a really, really big wide societal change. And when we're talking through whether or not we want this to happen, it can't just be about the individual implications as to whether or not you're happy with it. It needs to be about the implications of everybody else saying yes and how that changes the health service that you exist within and that your care relies upon and that you function and you, you hope to function for long into the future as a public health service within the NHS. So I think a lot of what we need to ask questions about is um, what are the wider drivers of this change? What are the kinds of transformations it could herald in how the NHS functions? And are those the kinds of changes that we want to see brought about in our healthcare system? So I think there's that, there's that individual level uh, decision that needs to be made, but there also needs to be that wider public debate about the kind of healthcare service we want to see. And frankly, you know, looking at some of the motivations that we've seen from the government, I'm very, very worried that their primary motivation on this is not doing this in a way that maximizes patient trust and increases the quality of patient care as their priority. So many of the announcements that we've heard from government about this, they've been made at the London Stock Exchange. They've been uh, co-hosted by JP Morgan. So even if we're concerned, you know, if even if there's some relief that Matt Hancock, who was very, very um, wedded to a digital future for the NHS is gone, you know, we know that Sajid Javid has come in and up until a few days ago, he was getting £151,000 a year advising on market opportunities for a health AI firm. Um, and a lot of the things that are motivating uh, the government's moves on this are around securing a future growing market for the UK in this kind of new economic horizon that Matt Hancock says he wants the NHS to contribute towards the UK winning the fourth industrial revolution in this. So when those are some of the motivations driving this process, I think we've got really good pause, uh, a cause uh, to, to, uh, to pause and, and rethink and get that wider conversation about the bigger implications beyond just the kind of, the, the kind of privacy and the, the kind of very important protection of our personal data. And I, I'm really glad to hear you talk about that kind of collective data and this idea of kind of you know our, our collective data being a sort of commonality that we need to kind of move forward on consensually because one of the things that I've been uh, and to have a sort of proper democratic debate mm-hmm. about that because one of the things that I've been noticing when I've been writing about the NHS for several years now is the trend you know there's a whole level of concern about private companies getting our data but even within central government some of the political narrative around healthcare has been very much around blaming patients, blaming patients for being fat and old and, and, you know, making themselves ill. And so the idea that they're slurping up all this data, which can then be cross-matched, even if it doesn't go out to private companies, which as Phil says, it, it, it is going out to private companies, even if it doesn't, I think they need to be much more transparent with us about what they, what they are actually considering doing with that. I mean, we also see the spectacle of uh, US insurance provide uh, health firm um, coming in and advising the English NHS on how to sort of manage risky patients and assess which patients are the most costly. We don't really, you know, we've got sort of legislative reform coming up in, 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 in imminently, we understand, uh, around the English NHS. So I think there's, there's a lot of, I think you raise really important points, Derma, about, uh, you know, the kind of bigger issues. And I see Phil was trying to come in on that point. Phil, yeah. I, I have been actually quite open about this. 
if you if you follow what has been published uh, in 2017, Professor Sir John Bell um, wrote what is the government accepted as its uh, life sciences industrial strategy. Okay, it's published on the Gov UK website. You can go and read it now. If you do, you'll see that the top recommendation says, right hand column, we will create two to three new industries in the UK in the next 10 years. I remind you, this is 2017 it was written, okay? And those three new industries are based on patient data, genomic data, that's DNA data, and AI and big data. So that's been their explicit goal post-Brexit. What will the British economy be at a first approximation? It will be a life sciences economy, yeah? This is not uh, every patient a research patient for the common good. This is every patient a guinea pig for driving the economy. Now, there was an update to that. Uh, life sciences, industrial strategy in 2020, same guy. You will notice that one of the people who endorsed the GP data grab was Professor Sir John Bell. You know, there are some very powerful players here who have had a, a, a long-term agenda. Yeah, Professor Sir John Bell's been pushing this since the Blair years. Yeah, but he's finally found a bunch that will actually go with it. If you look at the language of that life sciences industrial strategy written in 2017, it's full of references to DARPA and moonshots. Where does that sound familiar? Yeah. So the most recent stuff we've seen, the data strategy that came out from NHSX just a week or so ago, and before that, the Tigger report from uh, George Freeman, former Minister for Health and Innovation. Uh, and IDS, and in, in Duncan Smith and Theresa Villiers. You put this stuff together with the coming legislation in the autumn and their intention is quite clear. Tigger said, we don't need that nasty EU data protection law stuff. We're British, we can do it with the common law. Okay, that's one position. NHSX data strategy. We will use secondary legislation to set aside the common law duty of confidentiality. We will use secondary legislation to recategorize restratification as direct care. Okay, now those words may not mean a lot to you. So let me just explain what that is. Can I just, can I just- That's, that's, that's taking away your rights. Every right and restratification is exactly what you're saying, Caroline. Restratification is how they get the AI in there to spot the expensive patients and you know cherry pick the ones that they want to make money from i'm sorry this is all there so one of the things that a lot of people were asking in the well I, actually i just saw a comment i want to uh, i'll come on to that in a minute i just saw a comment in the questions that were coming up about just asking specifically whether genomes because i think people are really worried about this and you talk about darpa you know we know that was kind of dominic dominic cummings's big thing quite unregulated, not subject to freedom of information, all the rest of it. So there are real concerns about what's going on here. And, it, you know, without wanting to sound too conspiratorial, I think there are, you know, lots of people are asking questions about, are, is there plans? And I, I don't know if Helen might also want to, I know she is an interest uh, for her as well. Are there plans to link people's genomic records to this database? Are those linkages already happening? Is that something that's going on? Um. There isn't a huge amount of genomic data there yet, because the analyses just haven't been done, but it's very much in the pipeline. There are lots of people who are really interested. In it. And there's some really interesting stuff to go on. If you could find out from a blood sample which patients are at high risk of developing bowel cancer, then you could give them screening much more often and not waste your time screening the other people who are at low risk. I mean, there's some really, really good stuff to be done with this. It's not, it's not all bad, um, but it's also shades into, if you have that information and we just moved a bit more towards an insurance-based system, what, in, what implications would that have for patients? And so I think, I think there, there are so many conversations to be had you know actually if there's going to do they're going to do lots of genomic research and discover who's going to get alzheimer's or not if we can find you know actually there's loads of questions about what we want to know what we want to know about ourselves and what we want we're prepared for other people to know about us and 
there is this kind of it's all going to happen really fast and it's just too complicated for the patient so you know just trust us we'll we'll we'll, we'll look after your data and actually i think the thing that is really lacking all the way through this is is trust um and phil mentioned something which i think we're going to hear a lot about coming up uh, which is the concept of trusted research environments tres is the acronym um so what was proposed was that they'll take all your data put it in one big database and when a company asks for some they'll let them have it you know we'll ask a few questions but then we'll we'll give them a, a memory stick with a load of data on it now there's a kind of one way of not doing that is to say the data just stays within these few places which are trusted research environments which we think are not leaky and we'll keep everything confidential um but i think there's the we need to know more we need to know so much more particularly who says they're trusted who who's doing the trusting and do i trust them or do i do i do i believe they've done their homework well enough um so there are so many layers and one of the things that's happened up to now is that it's been left to gps to explain to their patients what's going on when gps haven't a clue themselves um and we're just thinking help we can't do this we don't know what's going on but it's been it's now our responsibility to to explain it to our patients and and absolutely i agree with phil that there has to be a big step back and i guess one of the things we maybe should talk about is how do we make that happen how do we make enough noise that becomes unacceptable to do the thing they're intending to do on the 1st of september tres or not it's, you know, it's not presented so yeah, whether we have the trusted space or not, you know, they haven't published the impact assessment yet. I mean, they say they're talking to, I saw Matt Hancock saying that he was talking to privacy groups. Well, you know, I'm part of the coalition, as is Dermot, that has launched a legal challenge and they're not talking to us. So I don't they're know what- They're not talking to us. They're not talking to us. <laughs> so we don't know what privacy groups they're talking to then that, that they're claiming. So it's not- Understanding patient data probably. It's not very reassuring that they are going to use these two months widely. So indeed, what what can they do? And I'm gonna uh, what can we all do? And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask Phil, you know, just a very simple question, which we've had a lot of people saying, just simply, how do I opt out? But I also want to uh, ask a second question, which we also had a number of questions about, which is how do I opt out? And can I? Because you know, a lot of people are, are quite happy to have their medical data used for legitimate research, medical research purposes, and of course for their own care. Um, and, and people are saying, can I be selective and can I opt out of this data going to commercial entities and agree that it goes to legitimate public interest research and my own care mm. needs? Can people well, do that? Uh, no? The simple answer is no. That is not the choice that is being offered. So it's, it's all or nothing, the choice, right? The choice you that you're being offered. Together. Well, now let me cl yeah. be clear. You're being offered a number of choices, which I will go through and carefully distinguish between, because people are getting confused. Okay? There are several opt-outs that you can do. And I will talk about the ones that are for what's called planning and research. That is the GP data grab. It was care.data. It is what's done with your hospital data. There are also opt-outs around the direct, you know, direct care uses, something called the summary care record. I am not talking about that. Yeah? The two opt-outs I'm talking about will not affect your direct care. Full stop. Okay? So anyone who needs to see your care record. So anyone who needs to see your care record will be able to see your care record. This will not affect it at all. Which yeah? was another of what of are called misinformation that was spread in the house Matt Hancock was saying, you know, it's really important to show your data so the doctors, when you go to hospital, will know what's been had, so you don't have to say your history over and over again. That was complete rubbish, because exactly. that has nothing to do with that. This has got nothing to do with your clinical care. And it's yeah. really, really important that patients are reassured that whatever they do on data, it has no impact at all on the care that they themselves get when they need it. Yeah, yeah, that's why I really want, thank you, Helen, because it's like, yeah, we really have to emphasize this. The government's been complete, not just sneaky, but outright just you know, dangerous in this regard. Okay? So there are two opt-outs that you can use. 
I'll deal with the one that you should do first. If you wish to prevent your GP data from being extracted from your GP, GP practice, going into this central database, then you need to do an opt out to your GP or to your GP practice using what's called a type one opt out form or letter. Frankly, you could just say to your GP in the context of a, you know, when you're busy them anyway, you could say, I want to have a type one opt out, yeah? But there is a form on the NHS digital website and there is a form that Med Confidential has published since 2013 and it works, yeah? And when your GP receives that type one opt out form, which you do for yourself and can do for other people in your family, they will apply a code to your GP record. And once that code is on your GP record, the data will not be extracted, okay? That works. There is another opt out that individuals can do online. And many, many people are getting confused by this. They go and do the online one and think it's, you know, they're sorted. Yeah. But if you go online and do something called the national data opt out, yeah. so any individual over about, I think, the age of 13 can go and do this on the NHS digital website, that will tell NHS digital not to you know, pass on your data that it receives once it receives it. It does not stop it extracting the data from your GP practice. Yeah, it's just telling it, don't give my data out to, to anyone else for any purpose other than my actual direct care. Now, that's been around for a few years. And at the moment, it's supposed to put uh, a limit on your hospital data being shared. Well, look at theysolditanyway.com. We've gone into the spreadsheets, we've looked at all of the releases of data, and about 80% of the time, because there are so many exceptions, they don't respect the national data opt-out. Yeah? So you can do it if you want, but it's not a substitute. Why we do suggest that you do it is that we're gonna fix it. They're gonna have to start respecting the law. Yeah? And when they do, that national data opt-out will actually be uh, you know, something quite useful if you don't want your data being used for purposes other than your direct care. But- and and that's the only way you can stop your hospital data being used. It is. You don't have any, any yeah. control over the flow into NHS. Yeah. There's no type one for a hospital. You can't give a letter to a hospital so they don't do it. And, and so Helen is absolutely right. You know, this is how you protect your hospital data. Um, but, and it's, it's um, I think, to do, you know, to do with the, 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 the two opt-outs that are being presented to people at the moment are actually confusing people as well. So when we do, you know, when you do pass this information on, that's why we on MedCombination's website have a full page going down it in order. It's important that you explain what each one does. Yeah, too many people are just thinking, I'll oh, just do one, oh, it's online. Or I think there's, you can also do the national data opt out in the NHS app as well. And people think that they've basically protected their data, but they haven't. So to be clear, because it is really confusing, I went on the web page of that, you know, and I've been following this issue for a while. I went on the NHS digital web page and got completely confused. I think they have improved it slightly as a result of pressure from the likes of, of Med Confidential Phil. But mm. uh, to be absolutely clear, the, the, the thing that's going on right now that's going to be, as far as we know, still planned to be uploaded from your GP to Centrally on the 1st of September is the type one opt out form that yes. you can get from the Med Confidential page. You can also get, if you can find it, from the NHS digital page. Uh, and that is the one, the type one opt out is the one that's really urgent now. And you can, we had questions about whether people specifically on that type one form, Phil, I know it's complicated for the other stuff, but specifically on that type one GP, People can also and need to do that for their children as well. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, I mean, the thing what happens there though is like it turns this from being once you've done it, it turns it. And you have to opt out, obviously, but it turns it into the opt-in that people want. Yeah. Yeah. Once you've opted out, you can then choose when you're happy for this to happen. If you're happy for this to happen, then you can choose to opt in. 
You know, we aren't going to get them offering us an opt-in system. It's just not going to happen. So we have to do that ourselves. And which at the moment, you know, because they haven't got the GP data, yeah, opting out of them getting the GP data yeah, is a strong signal that many people don't want this to happen. And it's not going to actually harm anything. They haven't got the data yet. And if you're opted out and you choose to opt in because they do it right, then fine. Because we are, we are getting, I think, you know, Helen and, and yourself already emphasised this, but we are still getting questions in the chat about, you know, there are concerns because of this misinformation from government, I think you're saying, mm -hmm. that, this, that people opting out will have some negative impact on their direct care and on communication between GP and hospitals. So just, uh, you know, we're being absolutely clear we're, that that is not what is going to happen. I think one of the other areas of questioning that I had uh, from several people was, you know, this sense that, well, if this is all we can do now to ensure that our data, GP data isn't being shared with, with people unknown, that we might not want to have any say over, if we can't stop it going out to private companies uh, it, 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 as well as possibly legitimate research, and we just have to opt out, that feels very unsatisfactory to people. You know, it's quite an individualised choice. It's not, a, it's not really a political uh, act in itself. Or, or is it? I mean, I don't know. What, 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 what are the panelists' views on? You know, is is opting out enough, or what else can we do? And will it enough? Will it have an impact if enough people opt out? Do you think? I think it depends how many of us do it. Mm -hmm. um, I think if enough people do, I mean, that is what sunk care dot data, the the one that was eventually killed in two thousand and sixteen, because so many people opted out of having their data sold for commercial purposes that that the thing was was scrapped. So there is a question about about numbers. Um, I think there are probably other things we should do, though, in, in the political sphere, which is actually writing to MPs. I know it sounds really hackneyed, but they don't actually get that many letters. And if they get a lot of letters that say, I'm really unhappy about this, what are you doing about this? Actually, they are likely to have to respond. And it's been very interesting. This isn't a necessarily a party lines thing. Actually, David Davis, who you know, not necessarily everyone's favourite politician, but he he does feel very very strongly about about privacy and people's right to their to their data. And and actually, clearly, when he spoke in the house, had done his homework and knew about it. So I mean, it, it's worth writing to your MP, whatever flavour of the MP they are, and saying how unhappy you are about this. I've just noticed a a, a question from somebody about. NHS trust selling data and I think one of the things that might come out of all this as well is uncovering some really dodgy deals that have been made in the years up to now that have kind of snuck through the radar that maybe Phil knows all about but never got the publicity that they should have and um, there's a there's a company called Sensine which is another yeah. Sensine which is another big data company which has got a range has paid various NHS hospital trusts large amounts for um or giving them lots of shares for hospital data and i think that's going to have some challenge so i do think that, that there's a momentum i hope yeah. there's a momentum we and have think... done, we have done this battle before and helen's absolutely right and uh, the point i made before care.data never extracted any gp data never but lots of people opted out because it might we are in the similar position now but the scandals that came out in 2014, the Partridge Review, the re, you know, the, 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 the top root and branch review of what processes were going on at the old Health and Social Care Information Centre were all about what was being done with hospital data. So, you know, we can't keep, I think, I can't remember who it was, someone said, you know, keep your eye on the ball on Twitter, I saw earlier on. It's like, yes, we really must. Yeah, okay. we're focusing on GP data and what we can do right now, but we need to be talking about all of our data and making all of it consensual, safe, and transparent. That's what we've been saying since 2013. And you know, each of those things has meaning in the context of what we've been talking about. I did see a question about Biobank, and I forgot to, forgot to mention this. When you opt out, yeah, it stops stuff for research and planning. That does not prevent you from giving your individual informed, explicit consent for any particular research study, yeah? So if you're a biobank volunteer, yeah, and you give your consent for your GP data to go there, yeah, that 
for that individual flow of data, that is possible. But you can't choose to sort of say, well, I only want legitimate research uses versus commercial uses because that's just not available. And Derma, I think you were trying, thank you, Phil. Uh, Derma, I think you were trying to come in on the question about uh, sort of wider political action that we can undertake and, and where this fits into the kind of bigger picture of NHS campaigning, which I know you're very involved in. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I, I, I've worked on Big Pharma for like over a decade, and I think the hallmarks and similarities between what's evolving in health and big tech and what exists within Big Pharma are frighteningly familiar. Um, and it, a lot of it is built around power and money and the monopolies that exist within the pharmaceutical industry. Sometimes their interests can align with patients' interests, but a lot of the time they don't. And so I think what we're worried about in this is that we will see in big tech a tendency towards similar monopolies forming. And sometimes those, the interests of those big monopoly players will align with NHS patients, but sometimes they won't. But whenever you're faced to get up against that big, the power and the influence and, and the resources of that industry, what you've got is solidarity and collective action. And that's what I think is going to stop this this time. Um, so we've got a petition on our website, which Olivia's already shared, Open Democracy have got the same Fox Club as well, uh, to express your support for stopping this glam, and we will keep you updated on how you can get more involved in that campaign. I, I'd also share, uh, brilliant, um, Olivia's also shared the Crowd Justice um, link, so the coalition uh, that involves everybody from David Davis to myself and, and lots more in between. Um, uh, we're keeping that coalition together because we do not have a huge amount of confidence that the legal bar that needs to be met for this to go ahead lawfully is going to be met by the government. And we think we've got an incredibly strong case and we will go to the courts if we need to, uh, to stop this from happening. Um, but if we if we do that, we risk losing um, and we risk incurring costs uh, and having to pay the government's um, defence. So contributing to that crowd justice uh, appeal is an incredibly useful thing that people can do and um, yeah and I think we've got uh, we've got a few months to, to organize and as Helen said communicate this to your political leaders get involved in the campaigns and the petitions that, that open democracy and Fox Club and ourselves and others are running um, and, and contribute to help that uh, that legal defence that we may need to, to draw upon if we want to fight the government in the courts over this because it looks like the thing that has force them to stop has not been like a willingness to do the right thing it's been it's being having their feet uh, held to the flames on this because they've got no choice but to live up to their legal uh, responsibilities so uh, yeah those are a few things i think are really important i think numbers also matter so print out the form give it to your mum give it to your cousins advertise you know send it to all your whatsapp contacts your facebook contacts however you communicate with people um and particularly the, the type one opt-out form, because I think, A, it's really difficult to find. So if you can find it and send it on to other people, that's really helpful. Um, but actually, you know, lots of people, some people will say, no, I'm fine, but lots of people will want to do that. So you're both doing your friends a favor, but you're also helping swell the numbers and send a signal that this isn't really okay. And I think the point that Phil made as well, that if you want to then subsequently opt back in, if the government does sort out the trusted research environments, if it does sort out all the concerns about where this data might end up going otherwise, then people can opt back in at any stage. And, and we would hope that, you know, because we all want to see the data used for the correct purposes. It's just that we have a this slightly blunt tool, which is the only way of protecting ourselves at the moment, I think. Um, so I hope that I'm conscious of time and I'm going to have to draw this to a close, but thank you so much. I certainly learned a lot from this interview and I hope that the, I know the listeners have too. And please do stay in touch with the organisations that you've had a whole load of links shared down there. We've got Med Confidential are doing, we've got Just Treatment are doing, of course we've got Open Democracy are doing. We've been writing on, I think we were the first outlet to write about Care.Data back in 2013. Uh, thanks back then to Phil, I think. Um, so do follow us for more updates as well and sign up to our weekly newsletter as a link to that should be appearing in the chat. Uh, next week, uh, we've got a live discussion, which is either going to be on the 
policing bill or possibly on the very live issue of uh, gay conversion therapy. So check our website for updates on which of those important topics it will be.